So how can I then stand up and say, I'm going to give you a vision of the future, tell you what the future's like, and it's guaranteed, when that's not the world we live in, is it? Um, it was Harold Wilson who once said that a week is a long time in politics. Um, this time last week, um, I was giving this talk, and um, I was reminded that two years before when I spoke there, I began by saying, imagine a world with Donald Trump as president, uh, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister of the UK, and Graham Norton, President of Ireland. And um, someone reminded me that it looked as though one of those three things might come true. Uh, Boris Johnson would be Prime Minister. And yet within less than a week, within just a few days of that, uh, Boris Johnson is no longer up for becoming Prime Minister. And yet, I would have said, if I asked you last Sunday what the likelihood was, you would have said there was a good possibility that he was going to become the next Prime Minister. And so in politics, we're used to things changing. And we've seen particularly recently how things are suddenly changing and the political system in this country is kind of in upheaval because no one knows what the future is going to be. Are we going to be run by two women, is one of the comments this morning. But it's not just politics. Let's go to sport for a minute. I don't follow football, but there was a match this week between England and Iceland. Um, Iceland have less people in their country than there are in Coventry, Wikipedia says. So that country, which is smaller than Coventry, has managed somehow to reach is it the semi-finals of, of the European Cup. You've got a high possibility of getting into the team by just living there. So how could England not have won? And I remember on Radio 2 and on Radio 4 in the morning and then the evening, the sports commentator commentating on it and just saying that it's a full-blown conclusion. England can't lose. Well, guess what they did? And, and even in tennis, you've got a situation on, was it Tuesday or Monday, where there is a man who is 772nd in the world rankings beating somebody in the top 50. It's unpredictable. And yesterday, um, Djokovic, who is allegedly going to win Wimbledon, and he's on a chain of events, he's won loads of uh, Grand Slam matches, and he's going to get there. Yesterday morning, the commentator said he lost the first two sets, but he's going to do well because he's come back with Avengers this morning after the rain, and he's going to easily win. And he didn't. He's out. Predicting the future isn't as easy as all that, is it? In, in those cases where I would say there was an obvious solution, it wasn't the one that happened. And um, uh, I kind of regret this, but recently I was at a meeting where I did this, and I said, what do you think the weather's going to do when you go out the back door? Do you think it's going to be rainy or sunny? Because it could be either these days. And at the end of the meeting, um, an elderly sister went and looked out, saw it was dry, left her umbrella in the meeting room, went out and got drenched. <laughs> and um, as I walked past her car, she very nicely mouthed, it's your fault. <laughs> so predicting the future, even predicting the weather, isn't easy. So how then can we say, we can show you what the future is going to be like? So I'm going to begin with a guarantee, and then we'll have a look at the vision. So come with me to the passage we read in Isaiah chapter 52. So Isaiah 52 verses 13, and then through to chapter 53. And if I was asked to ask, Someone here, um, I have done this uh, last week, I asked a nine-year-old uh, who he was speaking about and um, he said it was pretty obvious it's talking about Jesus. Uh, and when you look at it, it is, isn't it? Because verse 12 says, behold my servant, verse 13, should we deal, deal prudently? He will be exalted and extolled and be very high. Many were astonished at him. His visage, his face was so marred more than any man. Jesus was taken, he was beaten around the face, we know that. Um, he was lifted high on the cross. Um, God would take him higher to his right hand, but that's a separate uh, subject. Uh, going in, um, the king, shall shut, kings shall shut their mouths at him, for they which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Jesus was regarded as a great teacher of his day with profound sayings that people were amazed at, and we read that in the Gospel records. And then chapter 53, we read that he was, uh, verse uh, 2, halfway through, he hath no form nor comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, rejected of men, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And we'd say that's Jesus because the people didn't really, they turned their back on him, they pushed him away. Most people didn't want him. He was despised. And then verses 5 and 6 that talk about him being given stripes, whipped on his back, and we know that was true, wounded and bruised, uh, stricken. Verse 7, he was oppressed, yet he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Jesus didn't say much. He kept silent as a lamb to the slaughter, as uh, 
the passage goes on. He was cut off out of the land of the living. The, the emphasis there in the Hebrew is the idea that he didn't have any seed to follow. He didn't have any children, any family. Um, he made his grave with the wicked, verse 9, and with the rich in his death. The word wicked is plural. The word rich is single. So Isaiah says that he would make his grave with more than one wicked person and he would be with one rich person in his death. We know that to be true. He is crucified, crucified between two thieves and the rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, placed him in a tomb. So even that's true. He did no violence. Neither was deceit in his mouth. He never told a lie. So we'd all agree, wouldn't we, that Isaiah 52, verse 13, through to chapter 53, verse 9, speaks about Jesus. I accept Bible scholars will tell us that it also has links to Manasseh, but that he didn't fulfil all of those aspects. <coughs> but Jesus did. So when was it written? Well, we might fall into the trap of thinking it must have been written after the event. But if we know about our Bibles, we can find out that Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus was even born. But let's be sceptical. The earliest copy of Isaiah 52-53 that we've got there can be found in a museum in Israel, in Jerusalem, in a place called the Book of the Shrine, the Shrine of the Book. Um, and in there, you can go and see this extract of the scroll. And that's dated to at least 100 years B.C. So at least 100 years before Jesus was born, someone, Isaiah, someone wrote about 40 different aspects of things that would happen to Jesus before he was even born. Now, how could somebody do that when you can't tell me what the weather's going to be like at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, whenever we leave here? I'm not going to speak for that long, but whatever time we leave, you can't tell me what the weather's going to be like. You certainly can't tell me about tomorrow in Belper. And yet, Isaiah could, 100 years before Jesus was even born. And if you think that's amazing, then go to Psalm 22 sometime and look at 30 things there that are spoken about Jesus. King David, in Psalm 22, says that his feet and hands will be pierced. Uh, it tells you what would happen to the clothes he would wear. So for me, the guarantee is that if these men of God, as they call themselves, are able to predict with such accuracy things that would happen to Jesus, then that guarantees to me that these truly are men of God and inspired by God. And so no matter what politicians or anyone else tells me, I can take confidence that Isaiah is a book to trust. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build up a vision of what the kingdom is going to be like, of what the world will be like when Jesus comes back, based purely on the book of Isaiah, so we haven't got to go very far. And the reason why, I don't know this seems odd for me, there are no slides or anything, is because I think it's really good to build up our own vision, our own picture of what it's going to be like. Because that's what God has done, is through Isaiah, he has given us words that help us to build pictures in our mind as to what it's going to be like, to help us to want to be there, to imagine what life will be like in that time. It was the wise man Solomon who said that where there is no vision, the people perish. So let's not be the people that are going to perish. Let's be the people that are going to live forever in the kingdom of God, praising him and giving glory. So come with me to Isaiah chapter 1. I'm going to begin with um, a bugbear of mine, is that um, very often um, people who believe in the Bible will say that God is um, he's a very strong, uh, aggressive God in the Old Testament, very judgmental, black and white, and then he changes in the New Testament to become a loving father. Uh, I'm going to show you that's not true, because in Isaiah we have a loving Heavenly Father caring for his children. Let's have a look. Chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. So these are not Isaiah's words. He's saying, God has given me these words. I, God, have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. Our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger, they have gone away backward. So here is God looking at his children, the nation of Israel, and he's saying that despite all that he's done for them, they've turned away from him. They've become the seed of evildoers or the seed of the serpent, as we align it to Genesis 3.15. And Israel have turned their back to him. 
They have gone away back. When they have provoked him to anger. So what is he doing now? Verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. So here we have a father who is, as it were, putting his arms around his children and saying, come on, let's talk this through. Let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. <coughs> You've got a choice, says Isaiah. Your sins are bright red in my eyes, but I can make them as white as snow. They're bright red like crimson, deep blood red. But they can be like white wool, the wool of a lamb. All you have to do is to refuse the evil or you'll be devoured by the sword. Go back to verse 16. <clears throat> Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fathers, plead for the widow. So the father is appealing to his children to change their way of life to wash themselves <coughs> and make themselves clean. And there are parallels to the New Testament, which we'll come right back to at the end. But notice that James says pure religion is this, and you've got it there with the oppressing, uh, relieving the oppressed, judging the fathers and pleading for the widow. That's what pure religion is. So the father is pleading with his children to turn back to him, to come back, to repent of their evil, to change their ways, so that they can be his children again. And what he goes on to do is he goes on to tell them that as a result of their falling away, as a result of their sin, he is going to bring down the Assyrian first to take away Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, and then he's going to bring the Babylonian down to take away Judah. But all the time he is calling for the people to repent. And interspersed with that aggression, that northern aggression coming down, he puts in visions of the future, bright visions. And the first of those is in chapter 2 and verse 2. <coughs> verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, whenever you see that expression, the last days or the latter days in the Old Testament, it always refers to the, the end of time when Jesus establishes the kingdom. And we'll see that as we go through. And it says in verse 2 that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow onto it. So we have a vision here, a picture for us to put into our heads, of a hill in Jerusalem, a massive huge hill, and at the top of it there is the Lord's house, a phrase that's used for a temple. So there's going to be a temple, a literal temple at the top of the mountain, for, as we shall see in a moment, for people to, to uh, worship God. And unlike most, uh, if you go to a mountain, there's a river on it, a river flows down, a river doesn't flow up. But here we're told that the nations shall flow onto it. They're going to flow up. So nations are going to go against their natural ways, if you like, and they're going to go up the mountain. What are they going to go for? Verse 3. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his path. <coughs> the bride of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So a very different world to the one in which we live at this moment in time. You see, most people, when you talk about religion, say it's not for them. In fact, most people in the world will tell you that religion is the problem. It's caused more wars, it's caused more fallouts than anything else. But it hasn't. It's people that cause the problems. But in that day, all nations, so there are no exceptions here, all nations shall go up. And say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And they're not going up there to destroy it or to fight or to argue. They're going there to be taught. He will teach us of his ways. So for the younger uh, amongst us, um, it's like an eternal Sunday school. Uh, I would suggest you won't have to go to school anymore as such. It will just be an eternal Sunday school. And uh, we'll maybe consider some of the teachers a bit later. Maybe different to the ones you have at the moment. Uh, not that they're any, so I don't need to think. <laughs> I'll retract. I really should use notes. So he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. 
So he's going to teach people how they should walk, how they should behave. And, you know, people argue we don't want rules and laws and regulations from Brussels. Well, they're going to have laws and regulations from Jerusalem. Because in that future age, we are told, that out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is going to be the centre of the world. And God's law, which we see some of it in the scriptures to understand what the principles will be, will go from there. And he shall judge, verse 4, among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Uh, I'm not going to criticise the United Nations, um, but the United Nations have that quote outside their building in America. And they've been ex in existence, I think, from 1954. I'm not sure, to be certain. And they have, I think it's like 100,000 uh, peace ambassadors at the moment in the world who uh, are working flat out, and I would suggest failing quite miserably, because of the problems in the world. You see, man has created an organisation to bring peace and can't even get that right. And it says here that not only will the world be different, not only will it be that nations won't fight and there'll be no more disputes and arguments over borders and lands and currencies, it says neither shall they learn war anymore. So there won't be a military establishment at Sandhurst or anywhere else to teach people how they should kill and fight. There won't be terrorist cells set up to learn war at all. None of that will exist because it will all be different in that world. The house of Jacob, come me and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And so interspersed with the disaster that is about to come upon Israel and Judah over the next few years, Isaiah pushes in some visions of that future age to give them hope. And so for us too, in our difficult lives, in the world in which we live, we are being given here glimpses of the future that we can piece together and create our own vision of the future to come. Chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, so we're going back into this last day, in that day, says Isaiah, Shall the branch of the law be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. So there are a group of people in Jerusalem, the inhabitants, who are holy, separated. We saw this morning, uh, Ephesians 1, the link in there, that God is preparing holy vessels to occupy the future. But we, we see the link here with the holiness. Uh, and we see about the earth being few, beautiful and glorious, the fruit of the earth being excellent and comely. Um, I can't remember the figures, but there is a massive food bank still in parts of the world where they've got so much. Uh, Jackie and I were arguing, sorry, discussing um, tomatoes yesterday, uh, which were best. And when I got home, I just went, Jake, it's ridiculous, isn't it? We're, we're discussing... Uh, which tomatoes to have, vine tomatoes or not vine tomatoes, <coughs> and yet there are people in the world who don't even have a tomato. There, there are people who are struggling to live. But in that day, says Isaiah, the earth will be full of, of fruit. The earth will be different, it will be prosperous, and everyone, as we shall see in a moment again, will be able to eat whatever they need. And those that are left in Zion, those that are there, are these that have been called holy. And verse 4 says, when, so before that time, the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So there is going to be a judgment. God is going to have a judgment on the world, particularly here we're told Jerusalem and, and Zion. It, it's going to be washed, so the blood that's been spilled there will be washed away and cleaned. And there will be a spirit of burning. There will be some destruction to establish this kingdom. But ultimately, verse 5, the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and shining with a flaming fire by night. For upon all shall the glory be a defence or canopy. And there shall be a tabernacle for the shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and from a covert from storm and from rain. 
So just as in the Old Testament, the father looked after Israel by giving them a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So once more, he will become their defense, their canopy, their protection. He will look after the holy ones of Jerusalem, the holy people of his kingdom. There's this special relationship that God is building up and has built up for these people. Now, we're not going to look at every single passage in case somebody was worried uh, of the future. I'm just going to pick out some. So I'm going to go to chapter 7 now. And verse 10. So in chapter 7, it's talking about the Assyrians coming down. And the Lord asks King Ahaz for a sign, and then he doesn't choose one. But we go in at verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. Now, this shows then that Jesus and God are not the same person, doesn't it? God is going to cause a, a woman who has never known a man, a virgin, to conceive and bear a son. So Jesus isn't God. Uh, and there is only one person, to my knowledge, in the whole of the history of the world who has ever claimed to be born of a virgin, and that was Jesus. And um, the world kind of accept that, in principle, um, sometimes. But this child is going to be special. So verse 15 says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, I would suggest, I'm not sure who the youngest person is in the room, um, and I'm not going to pick on anybody, but it, you know who it is. So the youngest person in the room, I know, knows the difference between good and evil, and we all did as children. But we don't always choose to do the good. You know, even, even the nicest child, I would suggest, has a moment. Um, but here, Jesus always did that was right. He always chose the good, never the evil. And that's amazing, isn't it? That even from a child, he was different. And there's a time scale given. So Isaiah says, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. So before this child can do that, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And so it would come after the Assyrians had come down and taken away the kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. And then after the line of Babylon came down and took away the remaining two tribes. So both the kings have gone. Now is the right time. And if you look at the chronologies, you'll find that Jesus was born after that uh, fulfilment of those two statements. So chapter nine, verse two. And we can kind of think, in our own day, we may not have a war going on, well, we don't have a war going on in this country, but if you put yourself into mind what it must be like to live in Syria <coughs> or any of the other violent places in the earth where you don't know from one day to the next whether uh, somebody's going to drop a bomb on your house or whether you're even going to have a house tomorrow, or that's what it was like for these people who were receiving this message. So verse 2 says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. We won't go to it, but Isaiah 3 gives you the picture of the woman sitting at the gates with leprosy and dying. That was Israel in a valley of darkness. <coughs> but they would see a light. And Jesus said several times, I am the light of the world. The gospel writers and the uh, epistle writers often link to Jesus being the light of the world. So you can see how it all fits together. And then verse 6. For unto us a child is born. We saw that in chapter 7. Unto us a son is given. Now I find it quite remarkable that phrase, a son is given. So it's not a baby's going to be given, but a son. And that word given means to gift as a present. And you know if you ask anybody to quote a passage from the New Testament I guarantee that most would quote that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I find it incredible that God has allowed us to know that verse generally through um, population and then there's this prophecy here that that's going to be speaking of Jesus so we're without excuse aren't we to understand these things because God has made it clear for us so this child will be born of a virgin at a certain time and then now we're told that he's going to be given or gifted and the government shall be upon his shoulder his name should be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace so this is the man who is going to rule the world now, you might have a problem with who is going to rule the world. We could have ended up with somebody like Donald Trump, uh, Robert Mugabe, um, David Cameron as a world leader. 
But here we're told that this world leader is being created by God and put in place. So the question would be, wouldn't it, was do we want this person as king? I'm going to come back to that. Because the reason why I ask that question is look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So actually, he's going to be there forever. So we in this country are used to the fact that they, they elect someone into a position of prime minister. And then within five years, if they don't like him or her, they can vote another one in. And they don't last too long. I think it's two terms are allowed. Same with America. A lot of nations do that. But Isaiah says that this person who's going to be king is going to be there forever. He's not going to go away. And more than that, the increase of his government has no end. So this government is going to be a group of people, and then over time, more people are going to join that government. <coughs> and as that grows, so does the peace. Peace is going to be there, and there'll be no end to it. But peace will continue. And just in case we're in any doubt, God has now started through Isaiah to direct where that's going to come from. He's going to sit upon the throne of David. So Israel, that was forsaken of her kings, Ezekiel says in another place that um, one day there'll be no more kings until one day when the last king, the king we're looking at, will come and establish the kingdom. Okay, chapter 11. So let's look at the profile then of this king. Um, at the moment, several people are uh, putting forth their manifestos, you can call them that, uh, of what they are and why they should be elected as prime minister in the one case or leader of late or whatever it might be. First of all, we're told where he comes from. Verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, we're used to family trees, aren't we? Here's a family tree. So Jesse had a son called David who became King David. And we're told here that this person, this king that we've been talking about, will be a direct descendant of David. And if you follow the line of both Mary and Joseph, they both link into David. Uh, one comes through Solomon, one through, uh, I think it's Nathaniel. But both Joseph and Mary were both descended from Jesse. Uh, and more than that, look at the character. So this is the character of the person who's going to be king forever. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And you look at the world leaders today, not just in this country, but throughout, and you, I would ask the question, who do they represent and who are they in it for? Because this man is in it for God. Uh, this man speaks on God's behalf. This man understands God. This man is different. Verse 3 says that he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness should he judge the poor. And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. You know, you can't go to him and say, here's ten grand. Can you um, look after me? You can't bribe your way out of a judgment. If you've been speeding, you'd be caught. He isn't like that. He looks at the heart. He knows what you're thinking. And we see that, don't we, from the gospel records. Time and again, he knows exactly what the person is thinking. That's how different he is. And he's always going to be true to his word. He is going to be righteous. And he will look out for the poor. He will look out for the humble, the meek. And he shall <coughs> smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. One word from this king and you are dead. And one word from this king and you could live forever. That's the power that this man has. And if you were going to caricature him, then look at verse 5. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins faithfulness the girdle of his reins that which holds him together is faithfulness and righteousness verse 6 to 9 then show us some practical insights into this vision of the future that we're looking at the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed the young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Now, if I was to take one of the children to the safari park, at, um, I'm trying to think of the name, it's one Bugley, I think, um, and to open, go through the lion enclosure and open the door and just let them go out, um, and then close the door, um, that wouldn't be nice, would it? It wouldn't be good. But here's something that I always think that 
children, because I used to love this when somebody told me as a child, um, this is fantastic because you can, however old you are, you can go up to a lion and stroke it and it's fine. You can play with any of these animals and you're not going to get hurt. We could put the most dangerous snake in the world and give it to Stephen and he won't get hurt. That's the power of the vision of the future. That's what the world's going to be like. Where there is nothing to be afraid of. Where the animals will be nice. And it's not just the animals, because each of those animals at different times have represented nations. Some have represented more than one nation. And I think verse 9 is the conclusion of the whole thing, where it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. If you go to the sea, you can't show me a bit of the sea where there's no water. In that day, you won't be able to show me anywhere on the earth where God's glory isn't. It's that utter fulfilment. The earth will be filled with his knowledge, with his glory. Chapter 26. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation may enter therein, which keepeth the truth, may enter therein. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. So you see, the people who live in the kingdom, this age of the future, are people who have trusted in God. And they have this perfect peace, because they trust in God. Trust you in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Yahweh is everlasting strength. So these people trusted God now, and they'll trust him in the future, and they put their strength in him. Without him they are weak, but with God they are strong. Verse 8. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee, the desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in night, yea, with the spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Now this isn't about a group of people who can't wait for God's judgments to come on the earth when it comes with fire and thunder and starts destroying people. It's not what it says. It says, verse 8, We have waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. That's why they lived. Not because of the destructions that were going to come. But their desire, their life, the desire of their lives was to God's name and to remembrance of him. With my soul, with my life, they say, have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. You see, these men and women would wake up in the morning. And I would suggest the first thing they did was to pray that let this be the day when our Lord will come. And then when they went to bed at night, the last thing they said, the last words on their lips, was that let this be the night when our Lord will come. It was what they lived for and ultimately died for. They gave their life to God to remember him and to love his name. And why they wanted the judgments? For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. They don't, they're, not, they're not looking for a day of judgments and destruction. That's what will happen. Their desire is for other people to finally get to learn righteousness and peace like they have. They might share their love of God with others in the world. that they might behold the majesty of the Lord. And yet, every single person that Isaiah spoke to in his lifetime is now dead. And many more through the centuries who have read these words and got this vision in their head and have done exactly the same, praying day by day, night by night, for the kingdom to come, are dead. What for them? Verse 19. Even death will not prevent us 
Verse 19, thy dead shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. The word cast out is also translated, apologies for this, uh, to vomit. You see, the earth won't be able to hold them anymore. The earth will cast out, will vomit forth the dead. And those that have died with this hope, those that have died with a desire for this kingdom, together with his dead body which rose, speaking of Jesus resurrected, shall arise together. And so Isaiah and Daniel and Moses and David and all the others that are faithful that we have read of, those that in our own lifetime we have known who shared this vision and shared this dream, together with those that are alive at his coming, will be brought together. Verse 20, Come, my people, says the king, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. And so that judgment that we spoke of will take place. But those that are his, the people of the king, will be taken and put together into a chamber to dwell there for a moment of protection, a cover from the storm, from the heat of the day, until the indignation be passed, until the earth be cleansed, and then they will enter in to that glorious city. Chapter 32. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. So it won't just be the king, there will be princes. And I would suggest that by using other passages of scripture, we could demonstrate quite easily that there are people in this room who will be princes that rule in that day. People who have desired this kingdom will become part of that eternal government to establish peace upon the earth, to help fill it with God's righteousness and with his understanding. The vile person, verse 5, won't be there. They won't be there at all. They will be replaced. The eyes of them, verse 3, the sea shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. See, those who struggle with speech, those who are of a nervous disposition, those who have problems hearing, those who have problems with their sight, won't have any problems anymore. And chapter 35 brings all of that stuff together for us. When in chapter 35 and verse 1, Isaiah promises that the wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for them, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. If you look at Lebanon now, there's no glory there. It's a mess. Man has bombed it and made a mess there. But Lebanon once was beautiful, with tall cedars. And that glory, that excellency will return to those places, to the earth. Verse 5, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Those eyes that cannot see the atrocities that man does will be opened to see the beauties of that kingdom. The ears that cannot hear man's blasphemies will hear the songs of the redeemed. And those of us that struggle to walk properly through illness or through injury will leap as a heart. They shall run and not be weary, we're told elsewhere. And those who can't speak, the tongue of the dumb shall sing. In the wilderness, water shall break out, streams in the desert. The Sahara will be aflow with water, and with vegetation, as will any other parts of the earth. Why? Verse 9. The end, the redeemed shall walk there. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall flee away. Just imagine for a moment, try and think back to a moment in your life that you were the happiest you'd ever been. And then imagine that magnified. And imagine that never ending. And perhaps the only tears you'd shed the tears of happiness, of joy, of gratitude for being allowed to be there. God also knew 
that this wasn't going to be easy. And so we have verses 3 and 4. There would be times when, for want of a better phrase, the saints of the Most High God, this group of individuals who are waiting for this kingdom, there are times when their lives would not be easy. And so Isaiah puts in verses 3 and 4 for them, maybe for you. Strengthen ye the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that should have a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, and God with a recompense. He will come and save you. So don't give up, says Isaiah. However hard it gets, however difficult the pain, However hard the struggle, however lonely the walk, don't give up, says Isaiah. And let's help and strengthen one another. It's yet a little while, and the Lord that shall come, will come. So how then can we be part of that vision? Well, let's go to chapter 53, and to the verse that we stopped at, to verse 10. We're back to the guarantee. The guarantee that we know that he spoke of Jesus, these verses. And these verses tell us that he was made an offering for sin. We're told that with his stripes we are healed. We have forgiveness through Jesus. So what have we got to do? Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Genesis 3.15 says that the, the seed of the serpent would be bruised in the head by the seed of the woman. But the seed of the woman would be bruised in the heel. A non-fatal blow. Because the seed of the woman will be raised from the dead. He shall put into grief when thou, when you, the reader, when you or me, when we make his soul an offering for sin. And that's what it's about. When we realise what's been done for us, then we need to associate ourselves with Jesus. And in the Old Testament, they used to take lambs and animals and sacrifice them. We don't have to do that now. We just have to do what we were told there. The offering has been made. We just have to associate with it. We associate ourselves with Jesus. And that takes us right back to chapter 1 where we began. Because I'm going to suggest that tonight we have a loving father who looks at us and says, I have nourished and brought up children and they've rebelled against me. A people laden with iniquity Seed of evildoers, children that are corrupters. That's the world in general. If we're part of that, we need to think about where we are. Come now, says God, to you, to me. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like limbs, and they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. Verse 16, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil doings from before mine eyes. And all that was summarized when Jesus came. And Jesus said, repent. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the father. Speak to the widow. Put away the evil doings from my, before mine eyes. Repent. And be baptized. Wash you. Make you clean. And that's what we have to do. We associate ourselves with Jesus. We repent of what we were doing. We wash ourselves in the waters of the baptism and then we continue on to refuse, not to refuse and rebel, but to follow the ways of God. And then the beauty is that though our sins be as scarlet, God will make them through Christ as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, he will make them through Christ like wool, the covering of the lamb, that which Jesus did for us. So, there's a vision of the king of the future, guaranteed. You see, we know that's going to happen, for definite. The one thing we don't know is whether we're going to be there. So being positive, let all of us decide what we want to do with our lives. Let's listen to our Father now while we have the opportunity. And let's decide what we're going to do. Are we going to... Follow him and repent and wash ourselves and get ready for this kingdom so that we can give God glory. Or are we just going to wait and see what happens? And maybe the words of our final hymn will just help us to concentrate our minds.
even if we don't sing, we'll just read those words to ourselves. And I'm going to quote from the final verse. We know the end. We know the way. And some with life he will endow. Shall we be with him in that day? We make the answer now. May all our answers be yes. To follow him until he comes.